Today is an awesome day right here on the Andrew Burnett Show. I'm here with Melvin Jackson Jr., the Emmy-nominated actor and producer. Melvin, how are you doing today? Doing good. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Tell us a little bit about where your acting experience began for you. Hmm. Um, I think it came from when I was modeling and I was with an agency and they had me audition for PSA and never really did acting before. And, um, you know, audition for the, for the uh, role and in the book in it. And from that, that job, I decided that, you know, acting was definitely something that I wanted to pursue. So was acting something that you knew that you wanted to do all alone from a child or was it something that you gradually grew into? I think it's something I gradually grew into. I mean, music was my first love and that's what I was doing, managing artists and in the music business. So, you know, the acting side of things wasn't really something on the forefront of my mind. So you were managing artists, as you're talking about, from the age of 18. Yes. Who were some of these artists that you were managing? Uh, one was uh, Tony Bones was my first artist. And then I managed uh, my cousin. Um, uh, his name was Caramel Kid at the time in the first fam. Um, and then I did, uh, I managed another kid, um, uh, kid, what was it, Kid Link? Uh, Lynx is, was, was his name. So yeah, it was a few few artists and then, uh, another uh, group of, of uh, young guys I was working with as well uh, called the Local Legends. So are you still doing some of the management stuff today or are you more no. producing and acting? I'm not doing any management. I'm managing myself um, more, no more the producing and acting, and, you know, creating content. So how did you get starred in the HBO series, The Wire? Tell us a little bit about how you became familiar with that series. Um, it was one of my favorite shows. I'm not sure exactly how I think it was. I just knew about it was happening and that was in Baltimore. So I started watching the show, fell in love with, you know, the characters and what was going on and definitely wanted to be a part of the show. And, um, I somehow was, was contacted by the, by the casting, um, to be an extra on the show. And I was asking them how much was, was the pay and it wasn't that much. It was not more than what I was getting at work. So I wasn't really interested in that. Um, and then after the third time of, of, you know, after seeing no two times, the third time I was like, you know what, maybe this is something, you know, God wants me to, to go this route. And so I decided to say yes and glad I did. I met Wood Harris and a couple other cast members. And from that point on, started getting a chance to audition for the show. And uh, about auditioned about 15 times before I finally got the role of Bernard in season three. So you recently had the opportunity to portray one of my favorite actors in this industry, Mr. Eddie Murphy. Tell us a little bit about that. And I can tell just by looking at you, you have so much resemblance of him. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Eddie is definitely, you know, someone that I've looked up to in his business and really, really one of the reasons why I'm an actor and a comedian. <clears throat> um, I got the opportunity to portray Eddie Murphy first. It came from a web series that I created called This Eddie Murphy Role Is Mine, Not Yours, where I pretty much, you know, I'm taking matters into my own hand. You know, I get a chance to audition for the role of Eddie to play portray Eddie Murphy. And my, my brother decides to come up with the idea to take out my competition. So we decided to take out the competition to making sure that I get the role. So that is what led to the Emmy nomination. And then someone saw a friend of, you know, a friend saw the web series and then, you know, knew that they were doing, you know, uh, the Price of Fame on Reels um, docu-series about Eddie Murphy and asked would I be interested in auditioning. And so, of course, said yes, audition. And I got the um, email or um, like two couple days later saying that, you know, they would like for me to be the Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. And they actually already had two, two other actors that they were looking at um, and they were going into a meeting. And then uh, one of the other producers came in and was like, no, we have an Eddie Murphy right here. And so everyone saw the audition and saw my pictures and everything. And they was like, absolutely, let's move forward and see if he's available. Wow. That had to be an incredible experience. What what was one of the most memorable experiences for you during that time of being able to portray him? Was it somebody that poured into you or, or a quote that Eddie Murphy has said throughout his career that really stuck with you as you were recording this? I think just his journey. You know, he opened up the doors for a lot of African-American um, <clears throat> young actors and comedians and, you know, for him to, to start at a young age and really Saturday Night Live to be his, um, his only thing he auditioned for in his career, that's, 
that's something that too many actors can't say. I don't know if there's too many actors that can say that. And that's truly a blessing of how talented he was and how um, dedicated to the craft he, he was. And so that's, that's the thing. It's like he commits to what he, he the, the characters that he portrays when they're different characters, you really don't know that it's him. So I just simply, you know, have seen his work ethic and how he, his body of work speaks for itself. So that's kind of what has helped me just to m remain uh, focused and making sure that my body of work speaks for itself. So throughout the time of your acting career, who would you say would be some of your influences that have either helped you along the way or shaped you to who you are today? Definitely, you know, definitely my mom believing in me from day one and just continuing to just push, <clears throat> push me um, to go further. Um, you know, definitely God, of course. And, um, hmm. I mean, I would say just from watching movies, really, that just kind of made me want to um, go even deeper as an actor, just studying, making sure, you know, I just watched um, TV differently when I when I started, like, really studying acting. Um, I can't really pinpoint, but what I can say now moving forward, someone who's really, sh you know, helped shape me as an, as an actor is um, I, was my acting coach, uh, Sue Hamilton, that showed me a different way of um, auditioning and making sure that it's fun. Cause there's sometimes the auditioning is not fun and her, her motto is have fun or quit. And so that's always the thing. It's like, if you're not having fun, then why are you doing it? And um, find a way to make it, to make it feel like fun and you at the same time. So what about a memorable experience that has really just stuck out to you during the time while you're being an actor, whether it be a celebrity that has poured into you or what is one, one thing that really, just sticks out to you? Mm. Huh. Well, I would say, yeah, I, mean, I would say someone who really pulled into me, you know, for um, a performance of some years back was uh, Clifton Powell. When I, I did a, a play and, you know, the, the from, you know, that's all the thing you, you got to remember that you know, there's no small roles. You know, an actor can make a role bigger than what it is. It's about what, how you embody it. And so I learned that in that moment where it was a smaller role, but just the subtlety of what I was doing in that moment, I wasn't really saying too much, but it was the action that I was doing. And he pulled me to the side afterwards and he was like, man, you really did a good job. Just how you, those moments that you had were powerful. And I think that that's the, the key as an actor is you want to make sure that even when you're not seeing something, you're still as powerful as when you are speaking. So to a young person today that may be looking into going into the acting experience, what advice could you give them that has maybe helped you to who you are today? To, to never give up, you know, constantly believe in yourself and understand that you in the beginning will probably be your number one, number one fan. And um, you may have one or two people believing in your beginning, but if you don't, you have to believe in yourself and you have to continue to just put in the work. I think, a lot of times, you know, people get lazy and they don't want to put in the work. And it's like, you have to put in the work in order to get what you're trying to get out of the situation. You know, nothing comes overnight and it's going to take, you know, it may take you five years, may take you 20 years. It just depends on the, the, how, how focused you are in getting your craft accomplished and don't, don't wait, don't wait for nobody, create your own avenue. You know, one of the things that I have really enjoyed before you come on the show, I was doing a little bit of research and I came upon your Instagram and you were doing the Mel and Kale show. Tell us a little bit about that, how that idea originated. Well, you know, this came about because I wanted to do something with my wife, you know, during this time to just be, you know, uplifting and fun and, you know, <clears throat> gives us a chance to work with each other because we don't do it that often. So I wanted to kind of try this, this, this format and see how it works out. And um, it just started out, you know, us doing a show. We first started where we interviewed each other and then we just started getting, um, you know, our guests and friends of ours on the show. And now we're, you know, we just shot our seventh episode yesterday and it's been really fun and amazing. And, you know, we're just definitely seeing where this can go even after this, you know, if we can turn it into actually a platform, whether it be a podcast or whether it be an actual show as well. So will this still be continuing after the quarantine is way over or how are you going to end up continuing the show? 
I mean, I think I, the main like, the goal starting off, I wanted to maybe do ten episodes. So after ten episodes, we'll you know we'll kind of pr- pretty much take a hiatus, and um, I don't know if we'll yeah after the quarantine situation over, if we'll do it, you know do it again. We'll maybe do other things, but I think we'll use this formula to kind of maybe you know pitch an idea to to you know some platforms and see if they'll be interested. So who has some of your guests been so far? We've had Simone Missick, uh, who's in All Rise on, C- on CBS. Um, Yvette Nicole Brown, who was in um, the uh, the community, as well as um, you know, she does voiceover. She's she's one of my favorite people of all time. I love she, watching her. She's so amazing, such a such a uh, grounded individual. Both of them, and we've had you know, Indy, uh, India Kenny uh, Stearns, who was you know, my vice president of, of OWN, and she's an now consultant producer as well, and. Uh, we've had Kareem Grimes who plays Preach on All American on CW. Um, yeah, we've just had some great, some great guests. We've had Opal Staples who was on uh, Sunday's Best and um, just amazing singer and songwriter. And man, the, this the this has been amazing. Just the um, the guests that we have and the friends that we've been able to just um, bring on the show and and for other people to learn more about them. So you know, it seems to be a hot topic these days. That- what we do on this show is we try to bring unity and there's been a hot topic going on on the news that we're going to bring up with George Floyd. And, you know, I know it has affected so many people and even myself, as I sit here watching this man that screams, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You would think that the police would have took it as a warning to check the man, but they can continued to do what they were doing. Tell us a little bit about your heart on that situation. Yeah, it seems to be like a rerun. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, African Americans are victim vic- being victimized by the people that we are trusting to pr- protect us. And it's kind of, we were losing faith in the one, the justice system. We're losing faith in the, the police. It's not all police but other police are not holding those their their counterparts accountable and as a bystander i don't know if i could have sat there that long and just recorded and not have taken action you know unfortunately it's one of those things where if i was there i could have got hurt as well but at least somebody would still be alive you know and that's the thing you have to be be willing to not just stand on the sideline and record you actually have to now be smart about your action but making sure that you're protecting the person that's being hurt you know i'm not saying that you have to you know uh hit the officer or anything but some somebody needs to step up and say hey you guys he, his knee is on his neck he needs to that's not okay because you're sitting there watching the man get murdered like that's not something that you want in the forefront of your mind so it's definitely has created a heavy heart for me and i'm not you know have never been an activist but i'm like maybe I should look into being that because I feel like it's time to use my platform. It's time to use my voice, whatever I'm able to do. I feel like us, you know, us marching is great. I feel like now there needs to be an even bigger change where we, the voting happens. Um, People we put in office, people need to be held accountable when they do wrong, Um, especially the people who are in um, uniforms that are, simply there to serve and protect. So it's definitely, I'm tired. You know, I think enough is enough. And, you know, people are gonna just get outraged as you see, you know, people are protesting, they were rioting. And it's just, as a people, we're just at a loss of words. I think we keep seeing this over and over again. And the more it's, it's publicized, it seems like it's happening even more, which is, you know, dumbfounding to me. The more you feel like you, the more you will film things, the more you put it out there, and expose the 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 problem, there would be a solution to fix it, and it hasn't been. And you know, here on the show, we all are a family. We all need to come together and help one another, and not be divisive. Right. You know, I don't see, and I, as I've watched the video myself, I don't see how people were standing around holding up their cell phones, recording this situation had it been me i would have been afraid to say something because i would have been as 
been afraid that one of the police officers may have done that to me. Right. So, I mean, you know, from the looks of it, I, it was a scary situation to be put into. Absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's one of those things where it's like, you would say what you would say if you're not, if you're not there, like, you know, if I was there, I would probably do X, Y, Z, but I'm just saying that if you see something happen so many times, you got, we got to stand up and it needed to be more than one person coming over and be like, Hey, this is not right. Be like, Hey, he needs to get his, his knee off his neck. Like he needs to get his knee off his neck or we coming over there and making and getting him off of him. That's just how assertive we have to be, unfortunately, because that, the, that was not right. You know, George was not resisting. And then on top of that, he had two other officers holding him down. So I'm like, really? You got two other officers holding him down. You got one other person has his knee on his neck, another person in front, and no one's saying, okay, he's good, enough is enough. Like, what training did, you, did he have to, to, that tells him to put his, a knee on his neck? I've seen people, you know, officers put maybe their knee on the back, but not on someone's neck. And, you know, it hits too close to home with Ahmaud Arbery being killed just a few weeks before. Yeah. And, and I actually, mean, he actually was killed months before. It's just a video came out, um, you know, recently. I think he it happened like maybe a month or two ago. And, and so the video just happened to come out. You know, thank, thank God for that. All the guys will still be, you know, free right now. Right. But what I'm saying is, you know, the police officers were guilty in that situation. And what I've always said is if the ones who are protecting you are really hurting you, then what is the point of their job? Right. I mean, and that's when I said that's the thing that is tricky because <clears throat> it's not all officers. But unfortunately, there are some bad apples and their behavior is being pacified as being accepted by the higher ups and you're protecting them like you you fired them but why wasn't charged a charge why wasn't the guy immediately charged i don't understand that what do you need to investigate he should have been charged and then you can investigate and then go from there but the video clearly you see it in the video multiple angles of it there's nothing to to <laughs> more to really question and, you know, there's no reason even for a trial because if you see the guys and what they're doing on the video, they can't plead not guilty. I mean, it's on video. It's like with the deal with the college admission scandal going on right now. I mean, Lori Laughlin is sitting there saying, oh, I, I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty, which they're now pleading guilty. How can you plead not guilty when the evidence is on the social media? Right. I mean – things like that irk me i think people try to you know get out of it of course you know if you if you're guilty and you plead not guilty you're 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 hopefully trying to find a loophole and that's the that's you know, up to your defense like nobody wants to plead guilty unless they just you know the conscience is just went heavy on them and i like you know what i did it you know most times when you're facing when you get up against the fbi you most times they're they're they're, they're um, cases locked solid. Like when you go up against the feds, it's a different ball game than when you go up against state because it's more of a a locked solid case unless there's just a, a loophole or some way that you can find it. You know that you with you're not guilty and you come up with a deal. But most times it's better to take a deal if if you're facing those type of you know uh, years. And that's what I think that she. They they kind of came to their senses and said, you know what, let's just get this over with. They'll probably what do two months in jail, if that, and and go back to their lives. That is, it's, it's just a sad scenario. I mean, but we can sit here and discuss these hot topics all day long, but are we really doing what we need to do to fix the issue? Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we can sit here and talk about the news headlines all day long, but if we don't act on it, then are we really doing what we need to do as a U.S. citizen? And that's the thing where I don't think we're 
we're doing enough. And I think we have to do it as a united front. Um, there's so many cases that we don't know about. Imagine if the news was able to talk about everything that's going on that we would just, we probably, we, as it is, we don't want to watch the news because it's just so much bad news, whether it be the COVID-19 or whether it be, you know, police brutality, uh, police uh, killings uh, on our man, like all these things are just, it's so much. There's, there's like a, a sprinkle of positive in news most times and it's like 95% of it is, is negative. And it's just like, that's constantly embedded in our minds and people have now already created their own narrative of what the world is. And especially for African-Americans, the world is it, just, is different. You know, we're, we're free, but are we really free? You know, when we get stopped by the police, will this be our last day on earth? You know, we don't, we don't, those things shouldn't have to go through our mind if we stop, we're getting stopped for, for traffic, you know, fine, whatever it may be. Like, we don't want to have in the back of our mind, okay, I'm at to make sure that I comply in every situation. They don't think that I got armed, that even if you're not armed now, you're seeing that we're still a, consider a threat. And it's, it's sad. Well, Melvin, tell us what's coming up for you in your acting career. Well, um, on the acting side, I've, I've kind of, um, you know, don't really have too many things happening. I'm, I'm pro more pro doing the producing side of things. So I got a lot of stuff in the works on the producing side of it. Um, that, that's kind of really been a, my focal point. I'm still doing acting stuff, but I, I'm more so focusing on producing and making sure that I'm able to um, tell the stories that are important to, to uh, me and my team and, and making sure that I'm able to help other people coming um, behind me. So that's really my focal point, just continue to create content and, um, you know, tell stories. So will there be any new content on YouTube or something for our listeners or viewers to check out? Um, most stuff I'm probably going to be now going to other platforms, whether it be, um, you know, bigger <clears throat> uh, distribution, whether it be films or um, TV aspect, I think. You know, if it's a platform, it may be something like Quibi. That's what, you know, one that I definitely want to do business with. And this other streaming platforms, I think we've kind of reached the, we did YouTube and that's kind of, you know, good. But now it's time to really make a, a dent and make a impact in another way. So let's talk a little bit about how you got your role on one of my favorite shows, Everybody Hates Chris. How did that role come about? That role came about, <clears throat> I was... Three weeks in the California, back in 05, I, you know, I decided to come out of California, give um, it a go. I gave myself a month to to um, lock down an opportunity and um, and kind of go from there. And so being here within, you know, the th third week, I ended up getting an agent. And then that same day, I was supposed to meet with the agent to sign, you know, a contract. Um, she was like, I know we're supposed to meet today, but I got you an audition for everybody. Here's Chris. So I went down to the audition for it. Audition for one role, which was the original, you know, the bully that was there all the time. Didn't get that role, but they liked me and they knew, you know, knew, you know, my background uh, from the wire, and you know, end up uh, bring creating a role for me. So I end up having a recurring role as, you know, sometimes different people, um, sometimes the bully. So it was just a great experience to work, be able to work with Chris Rock and be a part of that cast with Terry Crews, Tashina Arno, um, Tyler Williams, and um, the list goes on. It was just amazing amazing um, opportunity and it was just great to be a part of that show and I think it was definitely ahead of its time. So to close out this interview do you have any new content that you would like our viewers or listeners to check out or how can they follow you on social media? They can go to my website melvinjacksonjr.com as well as Melvin Jackson Jr. and all social media platforms. Um, you can go and even check out the Mel and Kel show which is on my um, inter, uh, Instagram is also on YouTube. And um, if you haven't seen the everybody, the, this Eddie Murphy role is mine at yours. Definitely go check it out. Um, it's on my website as well as you know, YouTube. And the Price of Fame on, on Reels. If you haven't seen the Eddie Murphy uh, Price of Fame, check it out. It's really a good watch. And I think you'll learn a lot that you didn't know about Eddie Murphy. Well, thank you so much, Melvin, for coming on. And we welcome you back anytime, my friend. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.